try to understand this land Australia take her as she is her moods her mysteries mother of us all beneath the southern cross in her frame of peaceful seas try to understand this land Australia take her as she is her moods her mysteries mother of us all beneath the southern cross in her frame of peace From the moment human curiosity was born, we started to look at our world in a different way, as a place of wonders, marvels and mysteries. By the time any human eye saw Australia, the land was mysterious indeed. Australia had drifted alone for over a hundred million years. Time had worked some amazing tricks. Puzzles of nature that still challenge both the eye and the imagination. I'm going to take you on a journey across Australia and back in time. We'll try to unravel some of nature's ancient puzzles and we'll see what made them puzzles. We'll see how Australia's strange animals came to be the way they are. And we'll explore an incredible mystery that is just starting to be solved. A mystery of how long human beings have been in Australia. How often have you heard the Australian landscape described as flat and changeless? Flat it may be. But as one of the oldest landscapes on earth, nature has been given time to make it anything but changeless. Imagine a battle between forces millions of times greater than our most powerful weapons, between the elements and the earth itself. Sometimes it erupts into open war, but mostly this elemental battle of storm, flood and fire is fought by stealth. In nature, Time is the great magician who's been at work carving and sculpting the Australian landscape for a very long time. In the remote north of Western Australia lie the Hammersley Ranges. At three billion years old, they're among the world's oldest mountains. Once they were as high as the Alps or Himalayas. Today, they've been stripped to the bone. Remarkable not for their towering heights, but for their deep gorges.
Once these twisted rocks were sands on an ancient seabed, a seabed that holds no fossils. The Hammersleys are built from the ruins of mountains so old that they lived and died before there was life in the sea. Further north of the Hammersleys in the Kimberley region are the Bungle Bungles. Not Australia's oldest, but certainly her strangest mountains. Here, your imagination can really go to work. Minarets, domes, an ancient city preserved in stone. sometimes hard to believe that this extraordinary place is all the result of natural forces, wind, rain, erosion. And the same forces that created Australia's most remote natural wonder also created the most familiar, the Blue Mountains on Sydney's doorstep. Like a giant's maze, the Blue Mountains baffled the first white settlers. These sheer walls and deep canyons blocked their way inland. It took them 25 years to find a way across. Once they solved that puzzle, it still left the mystery of how the Blue Mountains were formed. What great force had pushed the cliffs up? or drag the valleys down. It's only in recent years that we've come to understand that rain and wind and time can create such a wonder as this. The trouble is that nature's time scale is just so different from ours. Often we don't see nature at work, although here we just might. <laughs> hanging rock is literally hanging by a thread. It won't hang forever and when it does go, it won't go quietly. Rock slides make all these canyons, everything from a few falling pebbles to an avalanche. All of it headed down to the sea, in fact, back to the sea, because the Blue Mountains started life on the ocean floor, but they were pushed out of home, forced up, a thousand metres above sea level. Now they're on their way back. It will take time, but nature has plenty of time. And when the last grain of sand is carted back to the sea, that won't be the end of anything either. Just the start of another cycle. The Great Barrier Reef of the East Coast. Not one, but a series of reefs running 2,000 kilometres north to south.
This is a place with enough wonders and mysteries to capture the imagination of any human explorer. In fact, a treasure house filled with the jewels of the sea. It's also a jungle where only the fit survive. The barrier reef is the world's biggest living thing. It's also the fastest growing. It's amazing to think that 20,000 years ago, this was all still dry land. A million years from now, it could well be dry land again. The sea hasn't always been the sea, nor has the land always been the land. It's human nature to think of our borders as fixed and final. We don't see the shape of Australia change, but it has and it will again. In fact, we've been invaded by the sea several times, and when it fell back, it left behind some of our strangest puzzles. Hot, dry land. Typical outback. The Flinders Ranges in South Australia proved heartbreak country for settlers who pushed too far, not knowing Australia's seasons were the greatest mystery of all. This is not the sort of place you'd expect to find sea fossils. But here, on the tops of these mountains, that's exactly what they did find. The fossils weren't just any fossils, but among the oldest known to man, fossils of sea pens, and jellyfish that flourished in the sea that covered the Flinders Ranges 600 million years ago. The puzzle of finding sea fossils like these hundreds of miles inland wasn't unique to Australia. As far back as the 11th century, a scholar put forward the theory that nature created life itself from the rock and that fossils were nature's failures. Fossils found on mountaintops were put forward as proof of the Great Flood. And that idea wasn't all that far from the truth. We now know that waves not only lapped the shores of the Flinders Ranges, but the ocean rolled a thousand kilometres further, all the way to Australia's heart. That's how the palm trees got to the centre. Today they survive in just a few sheltered places, but they once fringed that ancient ocean shore. The sea came not once, but twice. The first time it lay down great shelves of very hard sandstone. 
By the time it came back, they'd cracked into blocks, tipped on their side and changed into islands too hard for the sea to destroy. That's how Uluru, Ayers Rock itself, was born. Like a giant pebble in an ocean of sand, the rock is a feature in itself. No wonder it's become one of Australia's premier tourist attractions. But if the tide is out here, for this century at least, there's a gorge in Australia's northwest that's worth taking a look at. This is Geeky Gorge, where the Fitzroy River cuts through the Kimberley region, a favourite haunt for crocodiles. Scientists have found other species here apart from crocodiles. Freshwater stingrays, swordfish and even sharks. Species unique to these waters and a clue to the gorge's past. This limestone ridge, now far inland, turns out to be the ruin of an ancient coral reef. As big as the Great Barrier Reef, but 20,000 times as old. These caves at Janolan near Sydney are now high above the sea. But believe it or not, this too was once a coral reef. The jewels of this old coral reef lie not underwater, but deep underground. It's hard to believe that caves weren't made to be looked at, but the only thing that isn't natural here is light. Cave crystals are all made from the dissolved remains of coral shells and fish. It's still a mystery as to how and why these form. They're called helictites and can grow to an amazing one metre in length. One current theory on how helictites form is that a tiny particle of water too small to be a drip which would make a stalactite or a stalagmite, is sucked sideways by capillary action. And crystals form around the edge to form a hollow tube. And because this can happen unevenly, we get these weird, fantastic shapes. Confused? As I said, it's a theory. Nature's beauty belies her awesome power, and that's what I want to look at next. 
But first, I'd like to try you out on a song I've written about my land, Australia. Try to understand this land, Australia. Take her as she is, her moods, her mysteries. Mother of us all, beneath the Southern Cross, in her frame of peaceful seas. The shimmer of the midday haze on endless inland plains. The busy city's bustling pace, the drenching life-filled rains. Try to understand this land Australia. Take her as she is, her moods, her mysteries. Mother of us all, beneath the southern cross, in her frame of peace. snow-clad Alps on high, the fires, the floods, the searing droughts, just love her, don't ask why, just try to understand this land of Australia, take her as she is, her moods, her mysteries, mother of us all. Mysteries, mother of us all, beneath the southern cross, in her frame of peaceful sea. Nature has shaped and scarred the landscape in many ways, but our biggest and strangest battle scars are on such a scale they can only be viewed properly from the air. But maybe that's fair enough because the forces that created them also came from the sky. perfect volcano crater? The only problem is, it isn't. When aeroplanes started flying over this remote country, Wolf Creek was seen for what it really is, a meteorite crater. That meteor made one of the best formed craters on Earth kind of thing you'd expect to see on the moon. And it struck hard enough to make a crater one kilometre across. Keep that force in mind. In a moment, it'll seem like a minor collision. Goss's Bluff, more than a hundred million years old. Something here never quite seemed to fit. It felt unnatural. There were clues in the rock itself. They belonged thousands of metres below the ground. In 1965, Gemini astronauts were asked to photograph Goss's Bluff from space. 
Their findings confirmed what scientists had begun to suspect. The land had been struck by a force 200,000 times greater than an atom bomb. Enough to send a shockwave around the world. Goss's Bluff wasn't an outer crater, but a central impact zone. The outer crater, now worn away, was 25 kilometres across. Almost certainly what struck here wasn't a meteorite, but a comet from beyond the stars. Travelling across this vast country, I can't help but feel a sense of wonder, a sense of respect. If much of Australia's landscape is the oldest in the world, then her seas also contain the oldest life forms known to man. These shallow waters in Shark Bay, Western Australia, hold clues not just about the mysteries of life in Australia, but of life on Earth. What looks like rock or coral here is really nothing of the kind. They're stromatolites, stone cities, but living stone. So old, they make ancient species like the reptiles seem like babies. Stromatolites have been around for a staggering 4,500 million years. If these stones could speak, they could tell the whole story of life on Earth. In cross-section, stromatolites look a bit like marble, made up of millions of tiny fossilised creatures, too small to be seen with the naked eye. But don't underrate them. All life forms, not just Australia's, owe them a great debt. By extracting oxygen from seawater, they created the atmosphere of our planet, the very air that we breathe. So they were just as vital to my friend here as they were to you and me, to plants, animals, the lot, everything on Earth. But if we all started off as stromatolites, life got a lot more complicated later on. So much so that by the time scientists got to Australia, her animals and plants were the greatest mystery of all. Trees that grew nowhere else on Earth ruled Australia's landscape. Shrubs with unfamiliar shapes and colours even looked primeval. Our animals were stranger still, especially the marsupials. Our wildlife confused science and even religion. Some people began to speak of a second creation. Where were the kangaroos on Noah's Ark, they asked. Oddly enough, the truth was very much like that story. It's more than a hundred million years since Australia broke away 
from the great supercontinent that once dominated the world. But by the time we did, all kinds of plants and animals were already well established. No other continent stayed as isolated as ours. We literally became a lifeboat, a Noah's Ark, for a whole raft of plants and animals. Life in Australia evolved in its own distinctive way for over a hundred million years. That isolation saved many ancient species, including the marsupials. Marsupials are a primitive form of mammal whose babies are born as little more than embryos. It's a risky journey to the safety of mother's pouch. That's why scientists think marsupials lost the race for survival on other continents. But in isolated Australia, they both survived and flourished. A few living marsupials do survive in the Americas, but it was only here in Australia that they evolved as a complete animal kingdom. Take for example the possums, looking a bit more cuddly than they are in fact, but great survivors. In fact, the possums' friends and relations make up the biggest marsupial family of all. It includes the koala, not a bear at all, but a possum. A possum so lazy and friendly it didn't even bother to keep its tail. This is Matilda and Melanie. A bit like me, aren't you? You love a back rub. Hey, aren't they lovely? Aren't you lovely? Some possums got bored with the trees, so they climbed down and wombled about a bit, and still got bored, like the wombat. And a bit put out when they couldn't climb back up the trees. To show they didn't care, they burrowed instead. But even the marsupials weren't the most unusual survivors on board Australia's Ark. That honour went to the platypus. What can you say about creatures like this? Aren't they just marvellous? It's hardly surprising the first specimen sent to Europe was considered a hoax. The platypus, and its only close relative, the echidna, may be the most primitive of all mammals, the missing link with the reptiles. It took scientists a long time to work out what had happened. In fact, the whole theory of continental drift wasn't proved until the 1960s. When I was a kid, it wasn't even a respectable theory. It just shows you how quickly ancient mysteries can turn into facts of life.
The Aboriginals have been in Australia for a very long time. But how long? When did human beings first arrive in Australia is a mystery still not solved. <laughs> Aboriginal culture, legends and art stretch way back into prehistory. <laughs> So when Aboriginals paint, they pass on traditions dating back thousands of years. Mysteries only meant to be understood by the initiates of a tribe. In rock shelters, the Aboriginals have kept secrets carried legends across millennia. Some of this art is so old that even the Aboriginals themselves don't know who made it or what it means. Some believe they weren't made by mortals at all, but by spirits at the dawn in what they call the dream time. Dream time. Not a bad word to describe a distant past of a society that's turning out to be incredibly ancient. The biggest breakthrough on Australia's first people came almost by accident with an extraordinary discovery in the western desert of New South Wales. Flying over this shallow depression, a geologist saw it for what it really was, the bed of an ancient lake. This is, or should I say was, Lake Mungo, and these sand dunes once lined its ancient shores. Today, with the water long gone, the dunes have a remarkable story to tell. Peter Clark is one of the many people for whom unmasking the secrets of the lake has become an obsession. Well, we know the, the water's dried up, most of the trees are gone, but apart from that, what changes? Oh, well, for one thing, this area here has is, is, uh, been eroded fairly extensively. Uh, mm. the, the, the level of the uh, this sandy hollow has dropped about a half a metre since about 1980, when I first came here. The removal of that sand by the wind has effectively revealed all the, the, the fireplaces and the stone tools left by the people that once lived here. So the elements are doing the archaeologists' work for you, aren't they? The, the wind's acting like a giant vacuum cleaner. It's sucking off the sand and just leaving the hard, preserved pieces of stone, which have all been brought here uh, by Aboriginal people. What makes this site special is the changing colour of each layer of sand. The deeper the pink, the older the sand. As the wind sweeps these layers away, a record of human habitation can be read here like the pages of a diary. A record of Aboriginal occupation that stretches back an incredible 40,000 years. Double the time most people thought Aboriginals had been in Australia. Even this, the smallest, un, most uninteresting looking piece is a, a story to tell. Yeah, yeah that's, that'd be 
You can see, can't you, that that would be the makings of a knife or a... Yeah. M most of the tools you, you find here have got little um, secondary retouches on them and they were used for woodworking. There's just so much here on this site. For instance, look at these bits of uh, bird egg, probably swan or duck. Oh, yeah. Goodness me. Is this, is this the same then, this, this bit? Well, that, this little uh, burnt piece, it's uh, brown-black in colour. It suggests that it was thrown back into the fire, just like uh, we'd sit down around a fireplace if we were eating boiled eggs and flick pieces off and flick it into the fire. Oh, goodness me, eh? Let's leave them back where they belong. Great stuff, isn't it? That people were hunting here tens of thousands of years ago is confirmed by finds like this. The skull of a giant marsupial, now long extinct. Talking with Peter made me wonder what Lake Mungo might have been like in those days, when this now barren land supported one of Australia's major population centres. Forty thousand years ago, Lake Mungo was nine metres deep and teeming with life. Permanent rivers fed the massive freshwater lake. From camps on beaches like these, Mungo people fished and hunted, collected seeds and ground flour, talked, played and sang and lived and died. Society flourished here for an incredible 20,000 years. Then, as the lake dried up, they moved on, leaving only a record in the sand. Where we're sitting here, we've got a, a scatter of fish bones, burnt fish bones, which are, are 34,000 years old. A mere 34,000? 34, 34,000 years old. Yes, not, not, you, know, you can prove that. Yeah, this, this site's been radiocarbon dated, and what, what's happened is that a group of people here have come to the edge of the lake. They've collected uh, fish from the edge of the mm. lake. Probably they were dying because the water was getting salty at the time. They brought the fish up here, sat around fires and cooked them. And there are literally hundreds of fish um, covered over here by this clay material. Mm. So it's fairly awesome to think that we're sitting at a spot where people were sitting 36,000 years ago, isn't it? That's right. This part over here, this black ash is the charcoal yeah. remnants of the fire. That's all that's left of the wood. Right? And the rest of these little fragments here. Surely there's a wood here. Bone. No, that, that, all the little pieces like that you see are bone. There's no, no wood survives. The only wood is in the charcoal of the fire. And these are ear bones? They're, They're... the fish's ear bones. And from those ear bones we can tell the type of fish, the species of fish. We have golden perch. Murray cod, and also we've got mussel shells. So it was a bit of a smorgasbord, it wasn't just fish. There's the odd emu egg, got emus, kangaroo, um, a number of small animals that lived at the, along the uh, areas along the edge. Um, waterfowl, perhaps in the water. You could hang the shingle up, couldn't you? Yeah. What would you call it? Yeah. I don't know, I guess you, you could, call, could call it the oldest fish and chip shop. <laughs> But the most remarkable of all the finds here were human graves. One belonged to a man whose body had been carefully laid out and covered with red ochre. A simple burial rite, but astonishing because of when it happened. Would you believe 30,000 years ago? There are no earlier records of such burial rites anywhere in the world. So far from Australia being a backwater in the story of modern man, Mungo's people turn out to have been as socially advanced as any on earth. Alice Kelly is a descendant of those people who once camped on these ancient shores. No one lives here now, it's a national park. 
But for Alice, Lake Mungo still has a strong pull. I feel it's really great. And when you come, you just sit and... I just sit here. I get a lot of inspiration from these, from these places. Mm. I sit down here. It's so uh, spiritual around here. The spirituality of the place feels so great. When, you, when you're here, are you yourself in the 20th century or oh, are yes, you... Yes, I feel I'm drifting back in the dreamy. And how do you see the place? Oh, I see it really great. I see it beautiful. I see the waters. I could visualise the water. The sand, the ducks, the trees. So you don't see it as a dried up, no, barren place? No, I don't see place. it as a barren place. I can visualise it all. The campsites, the harmony, love and harmony of our people around the, around the shores. The, the, the fish, swans, and moonlight on the water and all that. You know, you could hear the sound of the birds, night birds. It's really great. Really, really you great. can't help but know that this is an ancient place and uh, here am I, proud of the fact that I'm a fifth generation Australian and it seems like five minutes. How do you stack up? Oh, I stack up something like a thousand, thousand generations back. A thousand? Yes, Goodness my me. word, I think so. Well, you belong, don't you? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Mungo people lived in a world that seemed permanent, and why not? It had lasted longer than any known civilization. But as the Ice Age ended, the world got warmer and drier. Their lake vanished. But the process took 5,000 years. Long enough for the Aboriginals to learn to adapt, to roll with nature's punches. As I walk through this incredible diary of history, I can't help feeling there's a lesson to be learned from it. On this journey, we've looked at how nature changes our landscape, and Lake Mungo is a graphic example of that. Europeans have only been in this country for a moment in time, a mere 200 years or so. Yet we've already set down firm roots. We think of our great cities as being permanent, but I can't help feeling how vulnerable we are to any major change nature might throw at us. After all, with the passage of time, this could be any one of our major cities 40,000 years from now. Will we be able to move on as readily as the Mungo people did all those years ago? Or might we cling to our permanent structures, obstinately using our science to battle nature? But that's a different story. To me, that's the mystery of human nature. <laughs>